You know, it is, um, it's almost Easter. Holy Week has started right now. It's Palm Sunday. Everybody hold your palms out. No, it's Palm Sunday. And, and the events of, of the week are just beginning. Uh, I want to encourage you to do something. Uh, Friday night, we, have, we got together as a team and, and just felt led to present again after almost 20 years, next year will be 20 years, that the Passion of the Christ came out. And uh, we are going, to, we have purchased the license and stuff to show that here in the public forum on Friday night. I want you to come out. Uh, some of you may have never seen this movie, and some of you may have, but when it is the most accurate visual depiction of what Jesus suffered for us that we have in modern day. We're going to follow that up with a time of communion and invitation for people who don't know Jesus to come to know Jesus but I think every believer should see this movie at least one time in your life just to catch a glimpse of how much Jesus loves us, okay? So, uh, and, and next Sunday, three services, 7.30, 9.30, 11.15. 15. My dad will be bringing the word at the 7.30 a.m. service, so you may want to get up early if you want to hear some good preaching. If you just want to hear the okay preaching, come to the others. But make sure to be here for that early service. And if you're serving in the other two services, that's a great service to come to and be fed and blessed and fill up so you can pour out uh, for those. And join us also in prayer and fasting this week for the people who don't know Jesus. Because even heathens come to church on Easter. They just do. Grandma wants them to come. So they come. Join me in praying for the heathens. Because God loves the heathens. Jesus died for the heathens. That person you think that's feathers from God. Be praying and fasting for them this week. And don't forget, many people will be here because somebody in this audience today asked them to come. Make sure you invite someone to church this coming weekend because an invitation to come to church is an invitation to encounter Jesus. Well, Jesus has been getting some good press lately. He really has. With the Jesus Revolution movie that came out, it's gotten a lot of stir and a lot of people talking and a lot of interviews going on on television and revival's been moving around the world. So international media has been giving attention to Jesus and we're grateful for that. It, um, you know, if Jesus were a politician, thank God he's not. But if he were a politician, you would say right now he's up in the polls a little bit. You know, he's, he's doing well among the, the popular uh, people. But, but <laughs> this must have been just a glimpse of what it would have been like for Jesus on the day that he made his triumphant entry into the city of Jerusalem. It's Palm Sunday that we commemorate this great event. I mean, people were surrounding him and shouting praises to him, and, and he, was, uh, he, was, uh, um, he was about to enter the city, and along the journey to go into the city, he had accomplished some great things, and people had been watching and they started following. So the momentum built and built to that moment when he comes into the city. One of the things he did along the way to Jerusalem was he healed a blind man. That's a pretty uh, fantastic feat to see somebody do. He raised a dead guy. That's incredible. I mean, you think you're going to a memorial service and you go to a resurrection, right? And, and, and he did something even harder than both of those. He saved a tax collector. That last one's a doozy. I don't know how he did that. That just shows you how powerful the grace of God is. But along the way, he does these miracles and people start following him and seeing what he had done. And as he gets to the, the, the gate of the city, momentum had built and the time had come. They're thinking, could this be our long-awaited Messiah? Surely his miraculous feats would qualify him to come and liberate us from the oppression of Rome. Jesus sent his disciples to go into the town and find the beast of burden, a colt of a donkey that had never been ridden before. And they brought him to Jesus, and then they placed their cloaks or their coats over this animal, and Jesus rides on, on those cloaks. And, and, and then we see Zechariah's prophecy in Zechariah 9 and 9 being fulfilled, that the Savior of Israel, the King of Israel, would come in righteousness, bearing salvation, riding on a donkey, on a coal, the foal, uh, the foal of a donkey. And this is where the commentator would say, and the crowd went wild. 
okay? Watch this. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and all that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up saying, who is this? And the crowd says, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. At this very moment, these people experienced the popular Jesus. Let me tell you about the popular Jesus. The popular Jesus is one that fulfills others' expectations. This Jesus that they worshipped, they did so because they thought that he was going to do what they wanted him to do. They wanted this miracle man to overthrow the tyranny of Rome. They wanted a Jesus that would meet their every need and fulfill their every desire in that moment. See, it was Passover week and people were flooding to Jerusalem from all around the known world. Most likely, as they gathered, they were celebrating the fact that God completely delivered them from an Egyptian regime that had held them captive. Now, when they started celebrating their victory and their freedom, this would make Rome nervous. It's just like the devil to... um, show up at the moment you're celebrating your freedom in Christ and and, and as Jesus is entering from the east side of the city, I believe it was, most likely Pilate would enter from the west side of the city. Jesus would come on a donkey bringing peace. Pilate would come through with horses and chariots reminding the people that Rome was still in charge. So they are embracing Jesus as a victorious king that's coming through the gates with hopes that he would deliver them. Again, Jesus was popular as long as he did what they wanted him to do. That's very important. And when Jesus is popular, everyone's a fan. He caused a stir in the entire city. Everybody was asking about him. They were shouting and crying, Hosanna, blessed is he. Yet even in their praise, you could see their selfish desires. You know, I've mentioned this before on Palm Sunday, but the word Hosanna means please save or save now. They were literally crying out for him before they said, blessed is he who comes. They were saying, Jesus, deliver us from the tyranny of Rome right now. Understand that crying Hosanna today is a good thing. We all need an eternal Savior. We all need a spiritual Savior. We were all born into sin and sin into us, and the only way we can ever have a relationship with God is to have a Savior. But they didn't want a spiritual Redeemer. They wanted a political Savior. They wanted a military Savior. While I'm talking about that, listen to me. America doesn't need a military savior. America doesn't need a political savior. America needs an eternal savior. And that eternal savior is Jesus Christ. But it's no different today. Listen now. Jesus is popular as long as he is compliant with the wishes of others. Really, Jesus is more popular when the church is more compliant with the culture. I'm going to let that one sink in. As long as Jesus loves and does not confront, as long as he affirms and doesn't challenge, he is popular. It's just like then. Jesus was and is king, but he was not the king that they wanted him to be. See, (laughs) it wasn't long until the popular Jesus became the persecuted Jesus. When you look at the next verses in the story, you will see that Jesus went into the temple and brought it into order as the house of God. He ran out the merchants, overturning the tables of the money changers who had been taking advantage of people, changing their money into Jewish currency so they could offer their alms to God. Listen, while I'm on the subject, Jesus still doesn't like religious people taking financial advantage of people. Uh, 
Anyway, let's move on so I can get out of here alive. Now, the religious leaders start calling into question his authority. Who's giving you the authority to do all of this? And it was not long until the crowd that cried, bless him, would soon cry, crucify him. And it's no different today. Everyone wants to embrace the popular, non-confrontational, passive towards sin, Jesus. They want to meet him at the gate of the city. But here's what I've learned. If you're really going to know Jesus, you can't meet him at the gate of the city. You've got to meet him at the foot of the cross. We can't only embrace Jesus when he's popular. We can't only serve him when it's convenient. One place he's popular and he should be is in church. Do you realize he's the most popular person here? You wouldn't come, you're not coming to hear me preach, you're coming to encounter Jesus. There's only one that we're all gathered around. He's really popular at this church. But when we leave this church today and we have to be the church on the outside of these four walls, we will find out he is less popular in the culture than he is in the church. And while it's easy to embrace the popular Jesus and to worship the popular Jesus and to serve the popular Jesus and to follow the popular Jesus, we also have to embrace the persecuted Jesus and serve him faithfully even when it's not the popular thing. When the culture's hostile to him, we must embrace him. When our friends want us to participate in things that sin against him, we have to embrace him. We have to embrace the persecuted Jesus. Wow. We can't just meet him at the gate of the city. We have to meet him at the foot of the cross. And to meet him at the cross requires more than a fan. To meet Jesus at the cross, you've got to be a follower. Are you hearing me? It requires a follower. When he's the punished, persecuted Jesus, the world cries, crucify him. And even some who know him intimately claim, I don't know him, as did one of his closest associates, Peter. But when you look at the scene of the cross in scripture, you will find that there was one that was there with him that never left his side, John the beloved. Now, Keep in mind that Jesus' disciples knew he was going to be crucified in Jerusalem. He'd already told them he was going to have to die. Peter says, I'll go with you to Jerusalem. I'll fight with you in Jerusalem. I'll die with you in Jerusalem. In other words, I won't leave you or forsake you. By the way, Peter didn't have the power to make that promise. Because Peter was subject to his own human limitations. Peter, convinced that he loved Jesus in the toughest moments of Jesus' life, cries, I don't know the man. But the man at the foot of the cross, John, he was more convinced of Jesus' love for him than he was his love for Jesus. I want you to think about that. Why do I serve the Lord today? Why do I follow Jesus today? Do I follow him because he can do what I need him to do? Sure he can. Do I follow him because I think I may get what I want out of him? Sure, there may be people who follow him for that reason. But the very thing that brought John to the foot of the cross was not the fact that Jesus could do what he wanted. And it wasn't even the fact that he loved Jesus. He was so convinced that the man on the cross loved him. Are you hearing what I'm telling you? He was so convinced that Jesus was hanging there for him. He had to be at the foot of the cross there beside him. We've got to get to the place in our relationship with God that we don't follow him so that we can get what we want and we don't worship to get our needs met. But we are simply so convinced that the man who hung on the cross for us loves us more than anybody else will ever be able to love us and it's done more for us than anybody else has ever done for us. We've got to serve him because we are convinced that he loves us that much. For his love doesn't fail in hard times. See, you must realize that John was at the foot of the cross in, in, with, the, with the situation that it could cost him his life. The same fear 
that caused Peter to say, I don't know him. He faced that same fear, but he was more convinced of love than fear. And he stayed there at the foot of the cross with Jesus. If I can communicate anything to you today, you should decide to follow Jesus because no one else has ever loved you like Jesus loves you. Wow. Jesus is looking not for fans, but for followers who will follow him no matter what. No matter the cost, no matter the rejection we may face or the persecution we may endure. Though none go with me, we used to sing, still I will follow. There is a world behind me and I visibly see the cross before me. But if no one else goes with me, I have decided to follow Jesus and there's no turning back. Where is that spirit in the body of Christ today that says, Jesus, I not only will embrace you when you're popular, but when you're personal persecuted and the world shows its hatred towards you I will be right there with you standing with you because I know you're standing with me wow it's necessary that we meet him at not at the gate but at the cross and here's why watch this Jesus told his disciples this is Matthew 16 if anyone would come after me let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me let's put this in context We come to his cross to find our cross. I didn't think that would get too many amens. Oh, I thought we came so we could do this. We come to his cross to find our cross. But hear me. His cross was a cross of punishment because somebody had to die for the sins that had been committed against God. But because we were willing to come to the cross of punishment, that's where we find our cross of purpose. Coming and meeting Jesus in complete surrender at the foot of his cross, he took your cross of punishment so that you could pick up the cross of purpose and your life can begin to make sense and your life can begin to have meaning. And your life can begin to have direction. But you don't discover your cross until you come to his cross. You don't discover your purpose without finding him in his place of punishment for our sins. Hear me. The reason a lot of people never watch the passion of the Christ is it's too graphic for them. It's too disturbing. And because of its graphic nature and offensive nature to some... Many people have removed crosses from their churches and they've removed it from their sermons and they removed it from their songs because it's too graphic, it's too offensive for the world. But hear me, any gospel that takes Jesus off of the cross is heresy. It is not gospel. It is no more than a feel-good sermon. I don't care how much they encourage you. I don't, know how, I don't care how good they help you feel. If they don't talk about the fact that we were born into sin, helpless and hopeless on our own, but there is one that came from heaven, Jesus Christ, that loved us enough to give his life on the cross of Calvary. If they're not talking about the cross, they're not preaching the gospel. The gospel is the power of God into salvation. And the one act that makes it possible is the shed blood of Jesus Christ that he willingly gave up on the cross of Calvary. There is no gospel without Jesus in the cross. It is both necessary and beneficial that we don't just meet him at the gate, but we meet him at the cross. Because here's the thing. The people who will meet the persecuted Jesus, embrace the punished Jesus, those are the people that experience the powerful Jesus. When we stand by him, when everyone else turns away, a couple of things will happen. First of all, we will witness that he can do what others cannot do. In Mark eleven two, 2, the Bible says, that Jesus sent him, or Jesus sent his disciples to get a, a, a small donkey or a young donkey, one that had never been ridden before. That's important. How many of you have ever broke a horse or a donkey? Or I'm not talking about they were whole and you broke them, but I'm talking about, you know what I'm talking about, right? Like you're the first person on their back. 
usually that person gets the right of their life. Because there's a wheel in the donkey or in that horse that's got to be broken. This had never happened to this particular donkey. His wheel was not broken, but yet when Jesus set upon him, he, came completely, he became completely submissive to his authority. And at the gate, he was showing people that were there because he was popular, I have come to do what no one else has ever done before. <laughs> I'm going to make the wheel <laughs> subject to my authority. It's no mistake that when we read the rest of the story and Jesus dies, in John 19, 41, the Bible says they laid him in a tomb in which no one had ever been laid. So the man that rode the donkey no one else had ever ridden was laid in a tomb in which no one else had ever been laid. Follow me now. And at the gate, when they praised him, he sent the signal, I'm here to do what no one else ever could do. But when, but, but when he got to the cross and they cursed him and they spat on him and they killed him and thought he was dead, three days later, the guy that rode the donkey that had never been ridden got up from the tomb in which no one else had ever laid. Because when he came to Jerusalem, he didn't come to be like another pilot. He didn't come to be another king or another governor. He came to be what nobody else had ever been before and do what no one else had done before. And the Jesus that rode the donkey that had not been ridden rose from the grave in which no one had laid and he is victorious forevermore having accomplished what no one else could do well if there's one thing I've learned Jesus specializes in doing things other people cannot do that's why there is no other name under heaven whereby man can be saved because no one ever became the sacrifice for sin died and then under their own power rose again on the third day bringing and giving us the only hope of eternal life you can't find it in Muhammad you can't find it in Confucius you can't find it in Buddha but you can find it in Jesus because he did what nobody else has ever done hallelujah it's neat the experience that a few people got to have around the foot of the cross and where it led. According to John 19, there were a few people there. And their story proves that people who will fully commit to follow Jesus will experience what others won't experience. At the foot of the cross was Mary, Jesus' mother, her sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, Mary Magdalene, and of course, John the Beloved. If you follow the story... You will find it was Mary Magdalene that came with the women to help anoint the body of Jesus for burial. And they discovered that the stone had been rolled away. It was Mary who would run back and tell John and Peter at the angel's instruction. Now, this is the beautiful part about grace. When you stick with God no matter what, and you stand with God when everybody else is kneeling down to something else, You'll get to experience things other people won't get to experience. But the grace of God says, if you follow him and even if you fail, there's a second opportunity waiting on you, a second chance that God will give you to experience the same thing as those who are faithful. That's the grace of God. Even if you fail, even if you fall, Peter has the same opportunity as does John as they run toward the empty tomb. John outruns Peter. Maybe you run better when you know Jesus loves you. <laughs> Maybe you get a little bit of extra kick in your step. John gets to the tomb before Peter, and then I can see. I picture Peter a little bit like me. You know, his hair's gone, he's, little, he's overweight, and he's... <laughs> when he gets to the tomb, where is he, John? Maybe they've stolen his body. Maybe something's... Peter and John eventually leave and go back home but mary lingers the one that was at the foot of the cross is now at the mouth of the tomb and a stranger speaks to her she begins having a conversation with a man 
whom she would soon recognize as the powerful Jesus. She saw the persecuted Jesus on the cross. She loved him through it all. And then she would know him when he says, Mary. She would throw herself at his feet as a disciple, fully confident that this was the man a few days earlier that was hanging on a cross that they put in a tomb, but today is alive. And I've got news for you. He's still alive. And if you'll embrace, hear me. If you will embrace the Jesus at the foot of the cross, you can walk with the Jesus at the mouth of the tomb. Are you hearing what I'm telling you? If you embrace the persecuted Jesus, the one that's not popular with everybody, the one that says, so deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me, you get to walk with Jesus in a way like all the people who know the popular Jesus never will. Because a lot of the people that knew the popular Jesus never knew the powerful Jesus. And Lord help me, I should be nicer on my first week back. But there's a lot of people filling churches today that are still worshiping the popular Jesus. Some preacher has fed them a line that if you'll follow Jesus, he'll give you what you want and do what you need. But there are some people who know this, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. If I don't get what I want, I'm still going to follow him. If I'm in need today, I'm still going to follow him. If I'm in plenty today, I'm still going to follow him. I want to know the power for Jesus and the only way to know him the only way to experience the Jesus at the empty tomb is to experience the Jesus on the wooden cross following him no matter what maybe it helps me understand Paul's writings in Philippians a little better let me give you his life perspective indeed I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things. And here's what he says about everything he lost. I count it as rubbish, as garbage. In order that I might gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God that depends on faith. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share our fellowship with his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may obtain the resurrection from the dead. Paul says, Everything I hope for is in Jesus. My eternity is in his hands. And I want to know Jesus and the power of his resurrection. On the day that with the sound of a trumpet and the thunder of his voice, the dead in Christ rise. But he said along the way, I may suffer some things. And I've lost everything, he said. But I count that as fellowshipping with him in his suffering, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection. What was he saying? I just want to know him in plenty or in want, in sickness or in health. When it's heaven on earth or hell on earth I'm going through, my life's goal is, is to know Jesus. And hear me. You can't know Jesus without meeting him at the foot of the cross. To those who knew the popular Jesus, they missed the powerful Jesus. It was the ones willing to know the persecuted Jesus, the one whom the world rejected and crucified, that would truly know his power. The world wants to meet him at the city gate. And many Christians want to meet him at the mouth of the tomb. But the only way to know him is to meet him at the foot of his cross. That's where sin comes to die and sinners come to find life everlasting. That's where past gives way to purpose. 
My question is, which one are you? Are you the person that knows the popular Jesus that makes for good conversation but no transformation? Are you the one that simply wants to see the display of his power? Are you someone that appreciates the sacrifice he made and you have knelt at the foot of his cross and surrendered all? The good news is this. You can do that right now. Right in this moment, right where you are, you can have a personal encounter with Jesus at the foot of his cross. Your sins will give way to his salvation. Your guilt will give way to his grace. And your past will give way to your purpose when you surrender your life to Jesus. I want everyone in the room to stand with me. Pastor Blake, I'm going to call on you to come forward and give a very simple invitation to meet Jesus at the foot of the cross today. With every head bowed, with every eye closed, if you're here today and you know that you need to make this decision to follow Jesus, not just because you know it's going to get you to heaven, but just like John, I just want to let you know he loves you. That's why he wants you. It's, it's out of an abundance of his love for you just as you are, just as you are. He knows every reason that you think that you don't deserve it. He knows every reason that you think that, that, that it would disqualify you. But the word says that as we were yet sinners, he still died for us. So just as you are right now, he just wants you. He just wants an ultimate surrender and an acceptance of his lordship. If that's you in the room right now, I just want you to slip up your hand. No one's looking around. No one's looking around. Thank you for those hands. Thank you for those hands. If maybe you're here in the room and and you haven't accepted him or you have accepted him, but maybe you've spent some time away and, or maybe when, when you have accepted him, you, you've been more so just going through the routine of religion. You, you come to church because you, you know it's the quote unquote right thing to do and, 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 you, and you try to be a good person, but maybe you haven't actually established a relationship with Jesus as your savior. Maybe you need to, to spend some time and, and rededicate your life to him and, and really fully accept him and allowing him to, to have in, in a full surrender of your life towards him to where you're wanting to follow his will and you're wanting to follow his ways. And let me just tell you that that full surrender that he desires is again just out of a attitude of love towards you, a motive of love towards you. He's not wanting to control everything that you do. No, 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 no. He loves you. And when you fully accept his love, it then causes you to want to be obedient to his will and to his ways. If that's you, if you just need to rededicate your life to him, I just want you to slip up your hand while no one is looking around. Thank you. Thank you for those hands. Thank you for those hands. I want you to say this prayer after me for those of you who need to accept him as your Lord and Savior for the first time. Lord, I thank you. Everybody in the room, just go ahead and repeat it after me and we can just do this together. Lord, I thank you for saving me today. I fully surrender my life to you. I accept you as my Lord and my personal Savior. I'm not going to look back at my past. I'm going to look towards you as my future. I believe that you died on the cross for me. And today I stand as a believer in Jesus Christ. And I fully commit my life to you. And I thank you for it. I thank you for receiving me. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen.
popular, persecuted, and powerful. Jesus was all three. And today, Pastor Barry posed the question to check our hearts. Are we fully surrendered to our Lord and Savior? You know, we all may be guilty of being the fan of God because everyone's talking and raving about Him. Or maybe we see the power and how God is moving and, and experience this mighty move of God. But it's in that moment that we have to take heed to the persecution and the work of the cross and the sacrifice that He made for you and I. So today, as we welcome this truth in our lives, allow that truth to transform you from the inside out, to live a life fully on fire for God, because each and every one of us, we have to meet Him at His feet of the cross, the work that God did for us. So today we invite you to um, join us in prayer as we live fully surrendered and moving forward as we celebrate who we are in Jesus Christ. Today, head over to gcchurch.tv, click on the prayer and praise button, because we want to continue to walk alongside you in prayer because there is power in prayer. What God is doing in the atmosphere, let's not be just excited about it, but let's walk in the full freedom that we have through Jesus Christ. And if you are new to Generation Changes Church, we want to invite you to be a part of our online campus. Sign up today by texting the word online to 615-488-7151. We want to do life with you. It's not about the Sunday experience, but what God is doing in us each and every day of our lives. And in this moment, we want to celebrate and say thank you so much for partnering with us as we reach the lost, make disciples and meet needs. As you give and show up in prayer, we get to have kingdom impact. And if you feel led today to give, text the word give to the number below to share an offering or your tithes today. As you go out this way, celebrate who you are in Christ and stand in not only the revival that has taken place, but what God has already done through the work of Jesus Christ. And remember one last thing, God loves you and so does GC Church.